Welcome to Living at the End, a program looking at the end of time and the time of the end through the eyes of the Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy. I am your host, Brother Nanton, and we will continue where we left off in our first session as we recognize not only that the Lord is coming, but that if we listen carefully with our spiritual ears, we can hear the footsteps of an approaching God as he comes to take his people back home and to punish the world for its iniquity. In our last session, we also realized that even the leaders of the world recognize that we are on the verge of a stupendous crisis and all must choose their sides as the closing events of this world's history comes upon us. We closed with Desire of Ages, page 636, which indicated to us that everything in the world is in agitation, that the signs of the times are ominous and that coming events cast their shadows before. The Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the earth, and rapidly are men ranging themselves under the banner that they have chosen. And my friends, today, it is our prayer that we have chosen to range ourselves under the banner of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, oh, we are so thankful for the abundance of information that you have provided for your people through the Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy. Those things that are coming to pass before our very eyes today as we prepare for the very end of time and for your soon coming. O oh, Father, help us and grant us your Holy Spirit in this program as we continue to look at living at the end. Bless us, Lord, as we study. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. In Testimonies to Ministers, page 116, we learn that past history is going to be repeated, both on earth and in the church. The Spirit of Prophecy says, Testimonies to Ministers, page 116. Many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession. Every element of power is about to be set to work. Past history will be repeated. All controversies will arouse to new life, and peril will beset God's people on every side. Intensity is taking hold of the human family. It is permeating everything on earth. Testimonies to Ministers, page 116. Even as we read these words and we think about the times in which we live right now, when it says intensity is taking hold of the human family. Every day we hear another scandal on the news occurring in the highest of places. The nations of the world are sparring with each other, not knowing what next will come. Disasters surround us on every side. Intensity as the spirit of prophecy says, is permeating everything upon this earth and it is taking hold of the human family. Praise God that you and I know what these things are, why this intensity is coming to bear upon planet earth today. For when we study the word of God, we realize there are no secrets that he holds from us that we need to know to be able to be prepared 
for the time of the end and for the end of time. In Manuscripts, Volume 7, page 417, also repeated in Letter 74A of 1897, the spirit of prophecy says, Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10.11, they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. She continues, The Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasures. Why? For this last generation. Let's repeat that, for it is definitely worth repeating. The Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasures for you and I, for this last generation of planet Earth. All the great events and the solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. The prophets, as she says, spoke less for their own time than for our own time. So it behooves us to take a very close look at all the prophecies concerning the end of time, so that indeed we might be prepared to stand in those days. We need not worry or wonder about what's going to take place. In Education, page 178, the Spirit of Prophecy says, The history which the great I Am has marked out in His Word, uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity in the future, tells us where we are today in the procession of ages and what may be expected in the time to come. All which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. In other words, my friends, if we want to know what is coming down the pipeline, pick up the prophets of old and read them diligently. Pick up the spirit of prophecy and study it carefully. And in it, we will be made to understand those things which are about to come, and we will understand that they will be fulfilled in their order. You see, according to Great Controversy, page 598, God has given us his word as a chart that points out every waymark in the heavenward journey. And we ought not to guess at anything. This powerful quotation points out two important matters of which we ought to be aware. One, it says that the chart of the Bible points out every waymark in the heavenward journey. That's point number one. We are on a heavenward journey. And my friends, don't you look forward to the end of the journey? We are on a heavenward journey. And each and every one of us must recognize that Jesus Christ lies at the end of this journey. He has gone to prepare a place for us that we might be where he is. In order for us to successfully complete that heavenward journey, oh, we must study to show ourselves approved. We must understand that in the Word of God, everything that we need to know to be able to stand through these times and not to be discouraged, not to be overcome by the world, but to overcome the world, we must realize that the Bible and the spirit of prophecy provides all the instruction and encouragement that we need to make that heavenward journey and to complete it successfully. And the other point made in this quotation is that we ought not to guess at anything. 
You see, God doesn't want his people guessing and wondering about. He provides full truth. He provides prophecy of the things that are to come. He is the one in charge of history. He knows the end from the beginning. And his desire is that not one of us should be lost, but that we should all come to repentance. So he has therefore provided for us everything we need so that we need not guess. But we must do what we aim to do in this program. Study to show ourselves approved. Be constant. Be diligent. Be instant in season and out of season. For Jesus is soon to come. And that is one appearance that we do not want to miss. God wants us to understand that the coming events of nations and his church are in his hands. And we don't need to worry. In Testimonies, Volume 5 and page 753, he says, The world is not without a ruler. The program of common events is in the hands of the Lord. The majesty of heaven has the destiny of nations as well as the concerns of his church in his own charge. And in Testimonies, Volume 5 also, this time on page 203, we learn that God restrains our rulers, for the hearts of all are in his hands. Boundaries are set beyond which they cannot go. Many of the rulers are those whom Satan controls. But I saw that God has his agents, even among the rulers, and some of them will yet be converted to the truth. They are now acting that part that God would have them. What a comforting quotation. Coming events are in the hands of God. Rulers, though many of them are controlled by Satan, cannot go beyond the bounds that God has set for them. So you and I can take heart, despite the problems that we face today in America, with rising polarity and political partisanship and the, the upswell of racism and white supremacy and all these things that are taking place, there are boundaries which are set by the hand of God. And men and women cannot go past those boundaries, for God has set up a time. And there is a coming judgment, and every man will have to answer according to his own deeds. So my friends, take comfort in this, that though the events of this world going on now can be frightening and discouraging and even terrifying to many of us. Take heed. God is in charge. This planet is not without a divine ruler. And he has foreknowledge of the events that are to come. In Bible Commentaries, Volume 6, page 1082, the Spirit of Prophecy says, God had a knowledge of the events of the future even before the creation of the world. He did not make his purposes to fit circumstances, but he allowed matters to develop and work out. He did not work to bring about a certain condition of things, but he knew that such a condition would exist. God is all-knowing. And he knows that when you leave sinful men to their own ways, that the outcome is inevitable and predictable. Sin begets sin. 
God did not specifically allow the circumstances as they have turned out to be such. But he knew that they would be such. Because the actions of sinful men only lead in one direction. They are led by the spirit of evil, by that great adversary, whose goal, whose objective is to deceive the whole world because he knows that he hath but a short time. And the more men and women he can take into the fire with him is the less time he will burn. For all the sins of the righteous, like in the sanctuary, will be placed on the head of the scapegoat. And that scapegoat is a symbol of Satan at the end of time. So my friends, be comforted by these words. That God is still in control. And as out of control as the world might seem, all these things have been predicted and a certain end will come and you and I are aware of that end because God has revealed it to us. In Prophets and Kings, page 499 to 500, the spirit of prophecy says this. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by man's power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold, above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and powers and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one silently, patiently, is working out the counsels of his own will. So when we look at the state of political affairs today, or the state of religious affairs in the world today, and we see everything going awry. We see scandal after scandal. We see error after error. Fear not. Because when we turn to the word of God, we will be able to pull aside the curtain and see that behind all of these interplays of human passions and power and money and politics, that the hand of God is at work giving man just enough time to fill up the cup of his iniquity, to make void his law before he begins to act. In Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1170, also repeated in Review and Herald, March 28, 1907, we hear again the spirit of prophecy proclaiming loudly, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. All kings, all nations are his, under his rule and his government. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 694, the spirit of prophecy continues. All earthly powers are under the control of the infinite one. To the mightiest ruler, to the most cruel oppressor, he says, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. These are wonderful promises of the Mighty One Himself, that He is in control of human history, including these perilous times in which we live. And we need not fear. Put yourselves today in the hands of God, and we will be covered by the abundance of His mercy and by the expansiveness of his great love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
promises to which we can cling with the assurance of divinity that we will be covered in those perilous days if we remain faithful. Be faithful, he says, unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Do you want that crown today, my friends? I certainly do. So let us pray together that we will have the faith, that we will continue to study, that as these perilous times grow more and more perilous, that we shall not be afraid, for we know that our lives are in the hands of the Almighty God. And what better hands to put our lives in? So the spirit of prophecy continues in this vein, making you and I aware that God has his hands on the controls. In Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 359, it says, When the power invested in kings is allied to goodness, it is because the one in responsibility is under the divine dictation. When power is aligned to wickedness, and do we ever see a lot of that in the world today, when power is aligned to wickedness, it is aligned to the satanic agencies. So my friends, we can be quite clear. When we see a leader showing goodness, doing responsibly what God has called him to do, we can be sure that God is the one leading such a leader. But when we see wickedness in high places, we can be sure that it is Satan who is driving and controlling that leader. In Great Controversy, page 610 and 611, the Spirit of Prophecy says, So long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. It still controls, to some extent, the laws of the land. While many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. Again, we are comforted to know that the influence of the Holy Spirit is still at work on this planet. It still controls, to some extent, the laws of the land. And even though Satan controls so many of our leaders, God has his people among the leading nations of men who help to restrain that evil power so that some measure of good can still be seen. In Education, page 178, the Spirit of Prophecy says this, The history of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place, unconsciously witnessing to the truth of which themselves know not the meaning, speaks to us. To every nation and to every individual of today, God has assigned a place in his great plan. Today, men and nations are by their own choice deciding their destiny. And God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. This passage indicates to me that every single nation in the world today has its allotted time and place. And God is the one who does that allotment. The nations themselves don't even understand that they are part of a divine plan. But nonetheless, we understand that God allows us, nations and people, to make our own choices. And the choices that we make today determine our destiny tomorrow. And God is watching it all, overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. 
And I believe when she says here, overruling all, it simply means that he still rules over all. He gives us choice. And he permits things to happen. But he knows where our choices will lead. So that we do have to take responsibility for our actions and for our choices. And it is my prayer that a program such as this and a ministry such as serving with a mission will help you and I to make those decisions that will allow our destiny to be heavenward, that will allow us to see the Lord in his glory when he comes to take his children home. So never forget, as we learn in Testimonies, Volume 6, page 145, that the whole universe is looking on this planet Earth with inexpressible interest to see the closing work of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. My friends, you and I and this planet Earth are on display to the rest of the universe to see what the outworking of sin will bring and how the judgment will work out and how sin will be destroyed so that it cannot lift its ugly head again. My friends, we are actors in a universal production, the director of which is the great God Almighty. The hero is Jesus Christ, and the antagonist is the adversary, that great dragon, Satan. The time is at hand. We are living in the threshold of the crisis of the ages. But fear not, God is still in control. And once we are faithful to him, his promise is that he will grant us a crown of life. At this time, as we prepare to enter into another subject concerning the time of the end, I would like to remind you that the source book for this program is a book called The Time of the End. It was written or compiled by James L. Hayward Sr., who is now deceased. But he was a respected Seventh-day Adventist minister who served the church for over 40 years as a pastor and an administrator in both the Michigan and Wisconsin conferences, and he was also instrumental in the work of the Voice of Prophecy. He is also recognized as one of Adventism's leading authorities on LNG White and the Spirit of Prophecy. So if you would like to purchase this book to follow along as we study, you can do so by simply going to American christianministries.com that's acm.com and on there you can go to their online store and you can purchase this book and you can follow along as we study it is an excellent resource for the remnant people to make preparation for the soon coming of our Lord and Savior so now we continue as we switch gears. Remember the whole purpose of this program is to look at the time of the end through the eyes of the Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy, both in chronological order and by subject. And now we want to go back in history and look at the beginning of the time of the end. And needless to say, the big question is, when did the time of the end begin? And we don't have to wonder about that, because the Bible makes it clear, and the spirit of prophecy is always there to clarify, to expound, 
to expand on that which we have learned from the Word of God. And when we look at the book of Daniel, chapter 12 and verse 4, we begin to see when the time of the end began. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, the angel is speaking to Daniel, and he says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And when you jump down to verse 6 of Daniel chapter 12, the question is asked, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And the answer comes in verse 7. It shall be for a time, times, and an half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Great Controversy, page 439, speaking of this same time, the time of the end, a time, times, and a half. Great Controversy, page 439 says, the forty and two months are the same as the time and times and the dividing of times. Three years and a half, or twelve hundred and sixty days of Daniel 7. The time during which the papal power was to oppress God's people. This period began with the supremacy of the papacy in A.D. 538 and was terminated in 1798 when General Berthier of the French Emperor Napoleon took the Pope prisoner and he died in jail. So the time of the end begins in 1798 and this is where we pick up the story. Historical publications confirm the dates of papal supremacy as being from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D. Reading from a publication called Medieval Europe, Beaumont and Monad, revised by George Burton Adams on page 120, written in New York and published by Henry Holton Company in 1902, this publication said, 538 A.D. From this time on, the popes more and more involved in worldly events no longer belonged solely to the church. They are men of state and rulers of the state. And Joseph Rickaby, in a publication called The Modern Papacy, from Lectures on the History of Religions, Volume 3, it was Lecture 24 in page 1, published in London by the Catholic Truth Society in 1910, said, Berthier, a French general, entered Rome on 10th February 1798 and proclaimed Rome a republic. The aged pontiff, Pius VI, refused to violate his oath by recognizing the Republic and was hurried from prison in France. Broken with fatigue and sorrows, he died. And with the Pope, the papacy was dead. Here we have history confirming the start and end dates of those 1260 years. 538 A.D to 1798 A.D., and thus the beginning of the time of the end is confirmed. Now the Bible not only tells us when the time of the end begins, it also gives us signs that happen before the time of the end begins to warn us that it is soon at hand. We find that in Revelation 6 and verse 12, you also find it in the book of Joel, chapter 2 and verse 10. And the Bible says, Revelation 6, 12, And I beheld 
when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The revelator is thus describing the first signs to precede the time at the end. It says there was a great earthquake. Now in fulfillment of this prophecy, there occurred in the year 1755 the most terrible earthquake that has ever been recorded to that time. Though commonly known as the earthquake of Lisbon, it extended to the greater part of Europe, Africa, and America. It was felt in Greenland, in the West Indies, in the island of Madeira, in Norway, and Sweden, Great Britain, and Ireland. It pervaded an extent of not less than four million square miles. In Africa, the shock was almost as severe as it was in Europe. A great part of the Algiers were destroyed, and a short distance from Morocco, an entire village containing eight or ten thousand inhabitants was swallowed up. A vast wave swept over the coast of Spain and Africa, engulfing cities and causing great destruction. It was in Spain and Portugal that the shock manifested its extreme violence. At Cadiz, the inflowing wave was said to be 60 feet high, that's six zero. Mountains, some of the largest in Portugal, were impetuously shaken, as it were, from their very foundations, and some of them opened at their summits, which were split and rent in a wonderful manner. Huge masses of them being thrown down into the adjacent valleys. At Lisbon, a sound of thunder was heard on the ground, and immediately afterward, a violent shock threw down the greater part of that city. In the course of about six minutes, 60,000 persons perished. This description that I just read comes from a book called Principles of Geology by Sir Charles Lyell, page 495, edited in 1858 in New York. And now the Encyclopedia Americana, in a note in 1831, said, The shock of the earthquake was instantly followed by the fall of every church and convent, Almost all the large public buildings and more than one-fourth of the houses. In about two hours after the shock, fires broke out in different quarters and raged with such violence for the space of nearly three days that the city was completely desolated. The earthquake happened on a holy day when the churches were full of people, very few of whom escaped. Remember what the Bible said when he had opened the sixth seal in Revelation 6.12. Lo, there was a great earthquake. Great Controversy, page 305, says that it has been estimated that 90,000 people lost their lives on that fateful day. And one geologist wrote in the book Earthquakes, page 142 and 143, his name was Professor W. H. Hobbs. He wrote, Among the earth movements which in historic times have affected the kingdom of Portugal, that earthquake of November 1st, 1755, takes first rank, as it does also in some respects among all recorded earthquakes. So as we see, my friends, history again proves the Bible to be 100% correct. A sign was given 
to planet Earth that the time of the end would soon begin and that all men must take heed. Now remember, in that same scripture, Revelation 6 and verse 12, another sign was given. It said that the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The second warning that God gave to startle the inhabitants of the earth into realizing that the time of the end was soon to dawn was given just 18 years before 1798. It was the dark day, May 19th, 1780. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 13 and verse 24 says, But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give its light. And Joel chapter 2 verse 31 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Great Controversy, page 306. The 1260 days, or 1260 years, terminated in 1798. A quarter of a century earlier, persecution had almost wholly ceased. Following this persecution, according to the words of Christ in Mark 13.24, the sun was to be darkened. And on the 19th of May, 1780, this prophecy was fulfilled. At the close of the great papal persecution, Christ declared, The sun shall be darkened, and the moon should not give her light. Next, the stars should fall from heaven. These signs all have appeared. And that comes from Desire of Ages, page 632. Continuing, in Great Controversy, page 308, May 19th, 1780, stands in history as the dark day. Since the time of Moses, no period of darkness of equal density, extent, or duration has ever been recorded. Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, the 1883 edition, states this. The dark day, May 19, 1780, so called on account of a remarkable darkness on that day extending over all New England. The obscuration began about 10 o'clock in the morning and continued till the middle of the next night. The true cause of this remarkable phenomena is not known. That's what Webster's Unabridged Dictionary of 1883 stated. But my friends, you and I, are smarter than the compilers of the dictionary because God has made us so. He told us long before it happened that it would happen. And although the dictionary says the cause is of this remarkable phenomenon is not known, you and I know it. It is a sign to say to the world at the time that the time of the end was soon to begin. On that same date, May 19th, 1780, the moon was to come up early in the evening, but instead it did not appear until the middle of the night. And when it did appear, it appeared as a ball of red, like blood, fulfilling the words of Revelation 6.12 and Mark 13.24. The falling of the stars, which is the third sign, we will discuss as we continue speaking about the beginning of the time of the end. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, even now as we continue our study of the time of the end and how and when this time began, 
we ask for the continued outpouring of your Holy Spirit, that we may be guided into all truth as we study these important things to prepare our hearts and our minds and to strengthen our faith to stand as these things come to pass before our very eyes so that, Lord, when you come in your glory, we might be saved in your kingdom. And for this we pray in the name of Jesus.